Well, good morning, friends. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you. Let me just set up the, the PowerPoint that will run here. It's always interesting to be introduced when one speaks in various places. Uh, sometimes one doesn't quite recognize oneself. Uh, it's, uh, as I mentioned last night, it's a particular pleasure for Wendy and myself to be here, partly to reconnect with, uh, with Lorianne and, and to meet her family, but also to, to worship with you. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, we appreciate the welcome we've received both from everyone here and also just from the Okanagan itself. We've had by Washington DC standards a harsh winter, which means by Alberta standard probably a pleasant, pleasant spring. Um, but by our standard it's been a harsh winter and so it was a delight to arrive on Wednesday evening uh, and have sun and uh, temperatures in the mid-twenties for, for three days. And then just to show how hospitable you are, today you've arranged weather to make us feel like we're back in England. So, uh, in every sense you've been welcomed. You know, I bring you greetings from the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And I really do, that sounds, that's a bit of a cliche, isn't it? In fact, my father was a pastor and a church administrator and worked at uh, a, a union office in Australia. And so he got to preach in a lot of different places. And uh, I would go with him as a small boy and, and hear him say, you know, I bring you greetings from, the, from this or that institution. I would think, really? Really? You're just saying that. Um, but actually, I do bring you genuine greetings from the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists from the World Headquarters. You know, I knew there were Canadians at the General Conference, the uh, General Conference Treasurer, Bob Lennon, uh, one of the Vice Presidents, Lowell Cooper. Um, the director of the church's legal affairs, Karnak Dukmetsian, but there are actually even more Canadians at the world headquarters than I realized. And when I, people heard that I was going to be speaking at the Okanagan mini camp meeting, they came out of the woodwork, and I came to realize that the GC is actually run by a, a mafia of Canadians. <laughs> and so, uh, among the greetings I bring you, I spoke with, uh, with Brad Thorpe, uh, on Tuesday and let him know I was coming and he sent me an email and said, I am so glad you are finally getting to the promised land, British Columbia and specifically Kelowna. Please give my greetings to everyone there. This is home for me. I started my ministry there and I'm so glad you are going there. I know you will be blessed and we are being blessed. And also though I bring you greetings from the president of the North American Division, Dan Jackson, uh, who uh, rhapsodized to me about his time in the Okanagan. He said he's pastored every church here except the Kelowna City Church. And I got the sense he wanted to tick that off his list before uh, the end of his career. Uh, but he said to me, uh, I appreciate your willingness to convey greetings. The mini camp meeting is a wonderful occasion. You'll have a great time. Please convey my very warm greetings to our members in the Okanagan. They are very special to me and always will be. And what he added to me in person, not in that email, was that he thinks he and his wife believe the Okanagan is the most beautiful place on earth. So this weekend, uh, my, our focus has been mission, but also Adventist history. We talked about history and mission last night. For the rest of this morning, let's talk about why our history matters. You know, last year, we touched on this last night. Last, can we focus the, the, the screen at all? Last night, we touched on the fact that May of last year was the 150th anniversary of the founding of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. May 20, 21, and 22 of 1863, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists was founded in Battle Creek, Michigan. Which means in three weeks, it will be 151 years since this church came into existence. And in five months' time, it will be 170 years since the great disappointment of October 22, 1844. 150 years, 170 years. This isn't what our pioneers imagined. 
Now, in one sense, it doesn't matter because the promise of Christ's return is sure. It doesn't matter if it comes when we expect it will come at the right time, and it will come. But in another way, this is a problem because, friends, as, as years, decades, and centuries pass, very often groups forget the key moments that shape them. What once were significant beliefs and practices originating in times of catastrophe, trial and triumph become traditions and then customs and then mere habits. Even if they are still practiced, their significance, their meaning is forgotten and lost. And when that happens, groups can forget their very reason for existence. One of the most loved quotations of our pioneer and prophetess Ellen G. White is this, We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and His teaching in our past history. Many of you could probably have said that along with me. But I put it to you, this is not only one of the most oft-quoted of Ellen White's statements, it is also one of the least listened to. Because it is almost as though by saying the words, we have obviated the need to pay attention to them. All too often, collectively, we do not act in accordance with them. And to a great extent, Seventh-day Adventists do forget the way the Lord has led us, for we tend to be very uninterested in our past history. And sometimes I think we feel that history is just not very relevant for us as Seventh-day Adventists. And after all, our very reason for existence revolves around looking forward to the imminent end of history. Sometimes I think we may wonder, is reflection on the past necessary or even appropriate? for a community of Adventists. After all, we believe our very name points to the second Advent, Christ's second coming, and our purpose is to bring that closer by preaching the word throughout all the world. Sometimes, perhaps, we may feel that knowledge of I believe the opposite is true. Paying attention to our history is vital both for us both individually and as a community, a community committed to fulfilling our Lord and Savior's last command to go and make disciples of all nations, a community committed to preaching Christ and Him crucified unto the uttermost parts of the earth and to proclaiming with the three angels the everlasting gospel to all those who live on the earth. And although I'm preaching about the importance of Adventist history, and we'll be talking more about that this afternoon, or rather this evening, for the rest of this morning now, I am going to be focusing more on the sacred history of Israel found in Scripture than on the history of our denomination. I do this because I believe that everything we do as Seventh-day Adventist Christians ought to be based on a biblical model. It ought to be founded on the Word of God. And friends, the clear message of Scripture is that our Lord wants all Christians to be aware of sacred history because this is one of the most potentially significant inspirations for the Christian. By the end, you may even say that God, in a sense, is that historian. In the Old Testament, God repeatedly draws His people's attention to their past, in which they could find proof of providential care and divine direction, so that they could draw new courage for their future and the tasks that awaited them. By looking to history, they could find grounds for hope 
for hope and for faith in God's guidance and leading. And one of the most striking examples of God's desire that his people know their history came at the beginning of the Israelite conquest of Canaan. Having succeeded Moses as their leader, Joshua bade the twelve tribes of Israel to prepare to cross the Jordan, telling them, listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you. The Ark of the Covenant will go into the Jordan ahead of you, and as soon as the priests who carry the Ark, the Ark of the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand in a heap. God was about to bring about a miraculous crossing of the Jordan. But friends, it's clear that the miracle must have been for a specific purpose because, strictly speaking, it wasn't necessary. As the Bible tells us, Joshua 3.15 the Jordan was at flood stage. Now at this time of year, the waters flow down from the mountains to the Dead Sea in great volume and with great force, rolling even large stones downriver as though they were pebbles. And this is the Jordan in flood stage. But for most of the year, the Jordan is like this. And to give you some context, these are not large trees we're seeing, they're small bushes. For most of the year, you could cross the Jordan without getting your knees wet. So God could easily have had the Israelites cross earlier in the year or later. He had them cross then because it allowed him to demonstrate to them and to the peoples of the neighboring kingdoms that God was all-powerful, that he loved the Israelites and was guiding them, and that their leader was his chosen agent. Now, God had given their parents and the Egyptians just such a demonstration of the crossing of the Red Sea, or the Sea of Reeds, which is what the Hebrew actually means, when Moses had led the 12 tribes. So now the new generation, who were either unborn or were children, 40 years earlier when the Israelites were miraculously developed, delivered out of Egypt, they were to be given a similar material demonstration of the power of the Lord of all the earth by being miraculously conducted into Canaan under Joshua's leadership. However, whereas the crossing of the Reed Sea was commemorated in the song led by Miriam, which is, of course, in Exodus 15, the Jordan crossing provided an opportunity for more concrete commemoration. And I think that this is one reason why God chose to require the Israelites to cross the Jordan while it was in flood. As Joshua 4, verses 1 to 3 tells us, When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose! Twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you. Friends, note that the Lord himself commands that a representative of each tribe was to take one of the great stones, the stones that would only be washed down the Jordan when it was in spate, and take it to dry land. Joshua explains to the chosen men that each is to take a stone to serve as a sign among you in the future. These stones, he says, are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Well, we are told the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. And having taken the stones out of the Jordan, they then carried them further on to Gilgal, now, Gilgal is over a mile from the river. Can you imagine these men trying to carry these huge stones a mile away? The point is, of course, where they're taking them, the stones could not have been deposited by flood action. They must have been carried by people. And we're told Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones and said to the people, in the future, in the future, 
When your descendants ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you. He did to the Jordan just what he did to the Red Sea. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and so that you may reverence and fear the Lord your God forever. <coughs> Friends, when recalling the miraculous interventions of providence in their past, God's people could not help but be encouraged and strengthened in their present. Remembering how God had acted in their history would make it easier for them to reverence Him and to worship Him. As Joshua told the men who took the stones from the Jordan, these stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. You know, I can tell you, friends, Historians currently debate when and in what culture people first began to establish historical memorials. The book of Joshua tells us that the first historical monument was created in God's direct command. But it was not to be the last erected at divine prompting. When the prophet Samuel is first recognized as the leader of God's people, he urged the Israelites, rid yourselves of foreign gods, commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only. And Samuel promised that if they did so, God will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Well, Samuel must have been a pretty good revivalist preacher because the Israelites do as he says. And then they gather at a place called Mizpah, to recommit themselves to the true worship of the one God. But the Philistines don't understand the concept of a revival meeting, a mini camp meeting. They assume that if the Israelites are gathering, it must be for war. And so the Philistines, we are told, came up to attack them. 1 Samuel 3 verse 7. You can imagine what the Israelites must be thinking. We've recommitted ourselves to God and now we're about to be attacked by the Philistines. But Samuel tells them, do not resist. Trust in the Lord. And the Israelites do. They wait on God. And the result is that while the Philistine army approached, Samuel, we are told, cried out to Israel, cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf. And the Lord thundered against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic that they were routed. Now Samuel wanted to ensure that the Israelites would not again easily fall into idolatry. As Ellen White observes, he hoped that the occasion might never be forgotten. Samuel therefore, we are told, took up a stone and set it near Mizpah and named it Ebenezer, which means stone of help, for as he declared, thus far the Lord has helped. And so a great victory over the Philistines, a victory you will not gain only by divine intervention, was permanently commemorated in the monument. And friends, it's striking that for the rest of the time that Samuel was their judge, the Israelites were at peace with both the Philistines and the Amorites, and idolatry was rare. Only when Saul became king did the Philistines trouble Israel again. The memory of the miraculous victory at Mizpah, perpetuated by the Ebenezer stone, helped not only to intimidate the Philistines, it also helped to keep the Israelites faithful to God. As well as inspiring the construction of physical monuments to his role in Israel's history, God, through his prophets, also repeatedly urged his people to study their history and his role in it. In Moses' final address to the Israelites, shortly before his death, he repeatedly urged them to preserve their history. He tells the Israelites, be careful and watch yourselves so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart. Be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord 
who brought you out of Egypt. All these are in Deuteronomy chapter 4. But neither was this a task only for the generation that had experienced miracles at the Sea of Reeds in Sinai, for Moses also enjoined the Israelites, teach these stories to your children and to their children after them. And it's striking that Moses portrays remembrance as something that requires care. It takes effort and it must be passed on to the next generation. This concern was an ongoing one for divinely ordained leaders of Israel. In Gideon's day, an unnamed prophet, we don't know his name, but we know what he said, he was sent by God to urge the Israelites to repent and return to God. This is before Gideon is raised up. Sadly, the Israelites don't listen to him, but what was his message? He begins with a reminder of their history. Ellen White writes that in the schools of the prophets that were established by Samuel to serve as a barrier against widespread corruption, among the chief subjects of study, she says, were the records of sacred history. Shortly before his death, King David, in a farewell address to his people, urged them that they ought not only to give thanks to God and to glory in his holy name, to seek the Lord in his strength. He also tells them, remember, remember his marvelous works which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. Remember. And when Nehemiah came to deliver his own valedictory address to the returned exiles from Babylon, he recounts to them the entire history of Israel from the time God chose Abraham, and then he rebukes them because they, like their forefathers, refused to listen and failed to remember what God had done for them in the past. God's desire that his people know their history, and especially the record of his action in their history, was not limited to the Old Testament era. When Stephen was charged with speaking against the temple and against the law by his constant preaching about Jesus. When he was brought to trial, he began his defense by a summary recitation of all Israel's history. And we may wonder, why does he do this? After all, he's being tried by the Jewish religious elite. They know their history as well as he does. Stephen's point is that Jesus' mission has to be understood in the long history of divine interaction with the people of Israel and the sad history of their rejection of his prophets, even those who foretold the coming of the Messiah. The gospel, in other words, made best sense when it was understood in historical context. The stories of Stephen and the other very first Christian martyrs and missionaries, they still have a power to move us. I find myself at times reading the book of Acts uh, almost moved to tears by the commitment that they show. When I read stories of those who founded this church 150 years ago, likewise, I, I have the feeling I'm not worthy. But you know, we have the stories of the very first Christian martyrs and missionaries preserved to us today because of Luke's efforts. But in writing what we call the book of Acts, what was Luke's purpose? Well, Acts was the continuation of the narrative of Jesus' life that we know as the Gospel of Luke. And we know that it had a similar purpose and method. So it's fortunate that Luke tells us how he wrote his works. In his introduction to the Gospel that bears his name, Luke begins, he says, he's writing to Theophilus. Now, Theophilus, of course, is a name. But Theophilus in Greek actually means friends of God. And Luke isn't probably writing to a believer called Theophilus. He's writing to all the believers, to the friends of God, because he tells them, I am writing because it seemed good to write an orderly account for you so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. History can help them know the certainty of what they've been taught. And he tells them that he compiled this orderly account from different existing narratives and eyewitness accounts. 
So both Luke's Gospel and the Book of Acts, in other words, were based on what we would call historical research. Luke was the first historian of Christianity. Just as God inspired the creation of the first historical monument, so he also inspired historical records of the creation of the church. And Paul, who stood looking on at the stoning of Stephen, approving his death, would have approved of Luke's actions. Not only was Luke Paul's close associate, but in addition, although the apostle tells the Gentiles that they're free from the strictures of the Mosaic law, he did not mean that they therefore could ignore the history of Israel or the history that Luke at that time was trying to piece together. Because Paul urges the believers in Thessalonica, in 1 Thessalonians 2, Brethren, stand firm. Hold to the traditions you were taught. The traditions you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. And it's because of a strong sense of the historical record of God's people throughout time that the author of the book of Hebrews could encourage the Christian believers of the first century, urging them to recall the former days of their own journey in faith, but also to reflect on the experience of past generations. And it is that that seems to prompt the author to write that extraordinary narrative of people of faith and of sacred history from Abel onwards, which makes up the whole of what we call Hebrews chapter 11. The author emphasizes that even Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and Sarah did not receive the things promised. And so in faith, they died. The promise was still to come. And the promise is still to come. But how, we may ask then, how were Isaac, Jacob, Esau, Joseph, Moses, and all the judges and heroes of the faith, how are they able to continue in that faith? It was because each generation has the example of the previous generation that has lived by faith. Trusting in the promise, but also being empowered by God to confront the terrible challenges that confronted them. We today, friends, we today have the record of so many more generations of faithful believers who endured torture, mockery, imprisonment, hunger, and all kinds of hardships, but nevertheless, through faith, conquered kingdoms, administered justice, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, their weakness was turned to strength. Friends, every believer to whom the book of Hebrews was written was surrounded by a very great cloud of witnesses. How much truer is that of us today? Because of their example, we, Scripture tells us, are able to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and run with endurance the race that concludes with Christ the author and finisher of our faith in heaven. Friends, our history is far from a stumbling block. It encourages us and it energizes us. And this then is the model that we find in Scripture. It is our past that empowers us for the present and for the future. Knowing how God has acted in our history reminds us of how much we owe Him. And it gives us confidence that he will enable us to meet the challenges we have to face now and in the future. And what is more, in our early days, Seventh-day Adventists were well aware of the potential for encouragement in the deeds of the pioneers. Both the pioneers of salvation history, the children of Israel, and the pioneers of Adventism. Including, of course, Ellen White, the prophetic guide of our church. Her observation, we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Friends, do you notice? It mirrors the explicit commands of Moses and David to the Israelites to remember and do not forget what God has done 
in his people's history. <clears throat> and nevertheless, nevertheless, Seventh-day Adventists collectively had been, and still frequently are, careless of our history. Well, that's partly because belief that Christ's return is imminent has meant we have made preserving our records a low priority. But contrast that with the Old Testament, which is largely composed of historical narratives. Contrast it with Luke's quest for sources, or with the schools of prophet, where the records of sacred history were preserved and studied. But in addition to not preserving the documents of our history, scholarly examination of the past has just not been part of traditional Adventist culture, despite the clear model we find in Scripture and in the spirit of prophecy. And I suggest that the relatively low priority we have given our history results not only from our feeling that because Jesus is coming again soon we have no need to ponder on the past, it also arises from fear that discreditable things may be turned up by new historical research. However, I want to tell you, as director of the church's archives, we don't have to be afraid of what we will learn if we dig deeply. There are skeletons in our cupboard, if you like, but they do not discredit the living body of Christ today, the church. Ignoring unpleasant facts about the past is self-defeating, inasmuch as those who don't learn from the mistakes of the past really do very often end up repeating them. But in addition, it's at odds with the example of Scripture. Think of the Bible, which repeatedly turns its readers' attention to examples not only of heroic faithfulness and divine intervention, but also of dastardly faithlessness and divine punishment. Ellen White points out that one of the best evidences of the authenticity of the Scriptures is that the truth is not glossed over, nor the sins of its chief characters suppressed. And she writes, Here only can we find a history unsullied by human prejudice or human pride. And she dryly remarked, How many biographies have been written of faultless Christians who in their ordinary home life and church relations shone as examples of immaculate piety. Had the pen of inspiration written their histories, how different they would have appeared. Biblical narratives, she observed, detailed the lives of the protagonists in full recording the struggles, the defeats, and the victories of the greatest men and women this world has ever known with all their faults and follies, and yet dishonesty is not depressing. Instead, she writes, seeing where they struggled and fell, where they took heart again and conquered through the grace of God, we are encouraged. Seventh-day Adventists individually and collectively have not always done things efficiently, competently, honestly, or in a Christ-like way. But that was true of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of David, Gideon, and all the people mentioned in Hebrews 11, and it was true of our Lord's own disciples. When Seventh-day Adventist Christians research our history, as when we study the Scriptures, we will discover the mistakes of sinful humans. Yes, we will. But we will also find the triumphs granted by God despite them. Awareness of how we have fallen short of God's purpose allows us to learn from our mistakes. And it ought to move us to renewed commitment. It is not when we are focused on our successes and virtues, but rather when we acknowledge our vices and shortcomings and are focused instead on our holy, omnipotent Father, that He then can work through us, transcending our weaknesses and transforming us into powerful witnesses for him. There is a final point. As well as being chastened by knowledge of past mistakes and missteps 
we can also be encouraged and inspired by the examples of lives of commitment and self-sacrifice. The pioneers of our church faced poverty, ostracism, hunger and imprisonment, but they were undaunted. And one of the best records of this is actually in a hymn that perhaps is not so often sung today, but I hope that some of you will remember a hymn called, I Saw One Weary, Sad and Torn. The first three verses of that hymn actually describe our pioneers. The hymn was written by Annie Smith, sister of Uriah Smith, who we see here. Uriah Smith was one of the four key leaders of the early Adventists. The other two were Joseph Bates and J. N. Andrews, who we'll, who we'll see in a moment. But they were the leaders along with James and Ellen White, of course. The man in the first verse is described as one weary, sad, and torn, with many a line of grief and care furrowed upon his brow, and that is Joseph Bates. This is, of course, the refrain of the hymn is, you know, oh, what can boil the spirits up, oh, this alone, the blessed hope. Joseph Bates ended every letter he wrote, not yours sincerely, yours cordially, yours faithfully, Yours in the blessed hope, Joseph Bates, every letter he wrote. In the second verse is a man who's described as one who boldly braved the world's cold frown, but worn with toil and oppressed by foes. And that is James White, not only husband of Ellen White, but far, far more. General Conference president for 10 of the church's first 17 years, founder of our publishing work, key theologian, one of the most powerful evangelists of the early hours. And in the third verse, we encounter one who had left behind the cherished friends of early years and honor, pleasure, wealth, resigned to tread the path, bedewed with tears. Well, it says that a still a smile of joy he wore, and yet that is any Smith herself. A gifted artist and writer, you can see her here in a self-portrait. But because she was a woman writing in the mid-19th century, Annie felt unable to refer to herself or even make clear her own gender. She was literally self-effacing. Yet though her church did not fully value her because of her gender, she gave her life to the church. Not only did she celebrate these others who then, who also gave everything that the three angels' messages might be proclaimed to the world, but Annie herself died at the age of 25 of tuberculosis brought on by overwork, working in the Adventist printing industry. She poured out her soul into death. And yet these were not alone in their total commitment. We touched on last night the fact that John and Andrews, the first Seventh-day Adventist missionary who went to Europe, literally starved himself to death, pouring all the money sent to him from America into the work that would communicate present truth to Europe. And in the late 19th and early 20th century, hundreds of Adventists boldly went from Western Europe, North America, and Australia to West Africa, Southeast Asia, and the South Pacific, even though they knew very well that this meant they would encounter tropical diseases for which no cures were then known. And many of those who went duly died and are buried there in humble graves, frequently forgotten by those who come after, but not by our Lord and Savior who died for us as they died for the cause of preaching Him. And to borrow words from the author of Hebrews, what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about, in addition to those already named, to tell about John M. Lockborough, Arthur Daniels, Kate Lindsay, Maud Sisley Boyd, W. W. Prescott, W. A. Spicer, Charles Kinney, G. D. Keogh, C. H. Watson, Ellie Froome, Ferdinand Style, Anna Style, Arthur Spaulding, Arthur Maxwell, and so many others. My challenge to you today is take one of those names and when you get home, Google them on the internet. See what you can find out about them. 
Our church has its own equivalent to the 11th chapter of Hebrews, even if it has not been written there. Friends, their examples can inspire us and give us new courage as we seek to proclaim the good news of salvation to a world that is broken by sin. Knowing our history connects us to all the past generations of God's followers, from ancient Israelites to medieval Christians to Protestant reformers to those who founded our denomination in the mid-19th century and all who have followed them. They are the great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. They are the metaphorical stones that have built up the church. Their examples remind us of what weak men and women can accomplish when they devote themselves to God, just as the twelve stones from the river Jordan reminded the children of Israel of all that God had done for them, from taking them through the waters of the Red Sea, out of bondage in Egypt, to taking them through the flood waters of Jordan, into the promised land of Canaan. And they point us towards the author and finisher of our faith, through whose power alone we will come to the promised land of heaven. You know, friends, brothers and sisters, I realize it's very easy for me as an historian to tell others to devote time to church history, which is not only my passion, it's my profession. The truth is we all have busy lives. There's only so many things we can do. There are only so many things we can be actively interested in, so I'm not suggesting that you all become scholars. However, you can encourage friends and children to become interested in our history. You can read some more about our history yourselves. What's more, local churches can explore their own history and the workings of providence in their past. Let me tell you, too often we think of Adventist history as being something of the history of the whole denomination. No. Every local church in the Okanagan has its own history. And I can tell you from experience that often people find recovering that history one of the most inspiring things they can do. And you as a local church can dedicate each year a Sabbath to the spirit of prophecy and Adventist heritage. And all of us can affirm, encourage, and pray for those who do research Seventh-day Adventist history that they may have the courage and the skill to both find and declare the truth. Because friends, if we want our church to go on, and if we are to be true to our Lord who bade us go and make disciples of all the world, we need the confidence that comes from knowing that God has acted in our history. We need the chastening of knowing that when we rely on our own strength, we fail. And we need the power that comes from knowing there is a great cloud of witnesses, ordinary men, of, men and women who are made heroes of the faith and potent vessels for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. At the start, I suggested that sometimes we may think the details of our past are a stumbling block. Dusty rocks, fossils that only get in our way, but seen aright, they are stones of meaning, whose purpose, like those taken from the Jordan, is that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of our God is mighty, and that we may reverence and fear the Lord our God now and forevermore. Amen.